So today is Thursday, September 2nd, 2021. It is 7.33 p.m. Uh, good evening, my name is Christian Klein. I'm the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, I'd like to call this meeting to order. Um, just quickly, uh, we are being recorded. Yes, perfect. Um, so I'd confirm that members and anticipated officials are present uh, from the Zoning Board of Appeals, Roger DuPont. I see you here. Uh, Patrick Hanlon. Here. Kevin Mills. Here. Aaron Ford. Here. And Stephen Redlack. Here. Good evening, all. Um, appearing on behalf of the town, uh, Rick Valarelli. Here. Uh, Vincent Lee. Here. And Kelly Linema. Here. Thank you so much. Um, and assisting us as always, uh, Paul Haverty. Evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. Glad to have you. So this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with an act extending certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency, signed into law on June 16, 2021. This act includes an extension until April 1st, 2022 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed to continue to participate remotely. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video webinar via the Zoom webinar app with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted, and the public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. So we have one item on our agenda for this evening, uh, which is a continuation of the deliberations on the decision for comprehensive permit for 1165R Massachusetts Avenue. Um, at its July 26, 2021 public hearing, the, the board voted unanimously to close the public hearing for 1165 R Massachusetts Avenue. This marked the end of the acceptance of testimony and new information in regards to the project. It also initiated a 40-day period for the board to consider and render a decision. On August 24, 2021, the board initiated its deliberations. At the end of that session, the board voted to continue to this evening, September 2nd. Tonight's discussions and deliberations are being held openly and publicly, but the board is unable to accept comment from the applicant, the board's peer review consultants, or the public. For this reason, tonight's meeting is being conducted using the webinar platform, which allows the board to limit who may participate in the discussion. On behalf of the board, I appreciate everyone's understanding. The board will resume its discussion using the draft decision available on tonight's agenda. It can be differentiated by the red text in the footer noting an August 24th revision. The board will quickly review the revisions proposed at the previous meeting, then resume the discussion on section G of the condition dis discussing the proposed revisions. At the end of tonight's meeting, the board may either vote on the final decision or vote to continue the meeting and continue with the deliberations. Under state regulations, the board must issue a decision by September 4th or request an extension from the applicant to further continue its deliberations. But I hope we are able to conclude this evening. <clears throat> So with that, let me pull up. Whoop. Linema, if you could give me permission to share my screen. Sure, one second here. I think you should be able to. I'm good now. Thank you so much. You're welcome. This uh, document here, so this is, um, as I noted, it has the draft. So this is the draft that um, Mr. Havity provided us after the last session. Um, and I don't know if everyone's had an <clears throat> opportunity to review it. I did have a few notes um, on this uh, document that I wanted to just quickly cover. If there's any, I'm just going to sort of go down through my notes. If others have notes and they want me to stop, uh, please just pick up. Mr. Chairman. 
Mr. Hanlon. Um, I have a number of notes that I've all I've given Paul already, <clears throat> and uh, as we go through, I'd be happy to to go through them. They're, I think, not of that not of great consequence, but mm -hmm. um, but there's there's several. Okay. Well, I was going to start with a minor one, just on six. Um, the second line should be six existing structures that just should be pluralized. Um, and then seven was a placeholder. Um, I had provided uh, Mr. Haverty with some <clears throat> uh, with an alternate language for that. Um, so we were looking for. I think we were just looking for a description of Ryderbrook and Millbrook. So I was going to recommend that the property contains two water bodies. Millbrook, a perennial stream, flows southeast through Arlington. The portion on the property is contained in an open culvert. Ryder Brook, an, in, an intermittent stream, flows southwest from the Minuteman commuter bikeway onto the property. The brook feeds into an enclosed culvert and empties into the Mill Brook. That's just a very simple description of those two bodies of water. <clears throat> my next issue was on number 10. Um, Want to include uh, the landscape architect Kyle Zick of KZLA, uh, the utility consultant Patrick Neon of ICO Energy and Engineering, and the development manager uh, Daniel St. Clair from Spalding and Sly Investments. Add those to the list of the applicants team. And then the question for Mr. so 13A for the principal address, um, it appears in the introductory documents from the applicant that the, um, the limited liability company is in care of Spalding and Sly Investments at one post office square, floor 26. I wasn't sure if we should include it that way or if it's fine the way it is. You repeat that, Mr. Chairman. Sure. So, in the, the in the original list of who was involved in the project, yep. it appears that the limited liability company, um, which is oops, sorry, um, the eleven sixty five R Mass MA Property LLC, it's yep. listed as being in care of Spalding and Sly Investments at one Post Office Square. Okay. So I don't know if we want it. Yeah, I didn't care. Uh, this is fine. They just want to add in care of Spalding and Sly Investments. Yeah, just because, just if that's appropriate, I think that would be more clear. Yep, that's fine. Okay. Next comment was on page six. Mr. Chairman. Yes, please. Um, I had one on, on paragraph 16. Paragraph 16, yeah. Um, I'd like to uh, add the following language at the end of that, at the, after the words Ryder Street in the third line, and will affect, parenthesis among others, and parenthesis, Residents located on the west side of Ryder Street, period. That's fine. Okay. And now you said it was an addition to number 16? Yep. Okay. I have 22, it's the first time we come across the term aura, which we reuse several times. Um, so I just wanted at the end of the first line, so it'd be the property currently contains 4,135 square feet of pervious surface within the, and I would put in adjacent upland resource area, and then have aura in parentheses, and then it's defined for the rest of the document.
And then in 24, I was going to recommend a comma after the word protection in the second line. In 25, um, again, recommend a comma after protection in the second line, and then after aura in the third line. <clears throat> And in 26, uh, the number 1,880, I would just add a comma after the one. Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. In uh, number 26? Yep. Need, uh, hold on, I need to <clears throat> go between drafts here. Um, I think this is... Okay, the, so I'll pass on this. There, there is an issue that I raised last, at the last meeting about native cultivars, mm -hmm. um, but this is not, it sort of comes up here, but this is not the primary place where it comes up. So uh, I'll turn to it when we, get, when we get to the right spot, I'm sorry. And I, I did re um, reference the comments that we had received on the from the initial draft decision from the Arlington Conservation Commission, and they did not um, make any comments in regards to the statement "all native plants" in this paragraph. So um, I believe that that <coughs> that brings us down to thirty-two and thirty. Three. I'm in for 31. Mr. Chair, Steve Rebelock. So on the on line, so how uh, the last line of the of 26 reads double check if native plants are used in all circumstances. Yes. I, I your your voice dropped out for a second. I didn't oh, hear. Right. The, the, outcome, the, disp the outcome of that? Um, so that I, I went back and re referenced the Conservation Commission's comments to the original draft decision, and they did not steer us away from this language. Okay. So I think that the, this language is correct, so we can just strike that last line. Okay, thank there you are. for the clarification. Absolutely. Was there a question about 31? I want to add language. 31. There's, yeah, there's language um, that could be in 31 or, or 33 I, <clears throat> that I provided to Paul earlier. Um, I would suggest uh, adding, doing one of two things, either adding a, a new 33 or adding a sentence to 31 to refer to the Minuteman commuter bikeway. Um, so option A is to do is to do the latter. It would be to add the language. In addition, the Minuteman commuter bikeway affords excellent bicycle access to the site. Mm -hmm. uh, another alternative is simply to add a new uh, paragraph 33, uh, where the language about which, which fills the placeholder that it currently exists. That would say, in addition, the Minuteman commuter bikeway affords excellent bicycle access to the site. Um, and I think that th that would be another place. To, that that would be another place to do it. So it's, the language is the same. It's just a question of whether it should be added to the end of, of paragraph thirty-one, or in a separate paragraph in thirty-three relating to the Minuteman bikeway. It's a that is a question on which I'm more or less indifferent. But it does seem logical maybe to add it to thirty-three to use that language for thirty-three. Mr. Haverty, do you have any suggestion here? I think using it as a new paragraph 33 works. So I had also proposed language for 33, um, which would note that the, the property is located approximately 210 feet southwest of the Minuteman Commuter Bikeway, a paved multi-use rail trail running from Bedford to Cambridge. There's an entrance to the trail at the northeast end of Ryder Street. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't know if we want 
more of a description as to what the Minuteman commuter bikeway is, or if we want to assume that it's understood what it is. Well, Mr. Chairman, as your language is nice language, and and I don't think it makes the opinion excessively long. I, I'd go for the. I was attempting to do it as as economically as possible, but <laughs> if you've got the language there, uh, I'd go with it as long as Mr. Haverty is satisfied. Um, and then going back to 32, um, I was going to recommend um, there presently exists a utility pole in the right of way leading to Massachusetts Avenue. The location is opposite the building at 1171 Massachusetts Avenue. The pole's position reduces the listed 20 foot width of the right of way to approximately 14.5 feet. Beta Group recommended relocating the poll in their May 6, 2021 traffic comment response letter to Jennifer Reed. Mr. Jim, what number is this? This is 32. 32. Okay. Which was a placeholder language regarding yeah. the poll. Yeah. Yep, I got that. Okay. Thank you. Any questions from the board on either of those? None. Uh, the next quick note I had was on 43, um, was just after the word neighbors in the top line, adding a comma. Yep. Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. If I could, uh, I would like to raise a question I did before and I tried hard to go through the tape to find this. Um, and I'm hoping that Ms. maybe Mr. Revelac can clarify. It has to do with the bicycle parking spaces. My recollection is that we started off with, with some language that essentially required that allowed stacking under certain circumstances. And it may be here, and this comes up at a later thing. Mr. St. Clair, objected that the way in which we had originally stated it limited one to them to one technology for stacking as opposed to uh, uh, making which which was associated as I understood it to one or a few vendors and that they wanted to have more flexibility to solve the problem that they were perfectly willing to solve. Um, I can't I can't remember what the favorite language was. And I'm not, and I'm not sure that we've got it. And I wondered if Mr. Revelac, who is certainly our main expert on bicycles in some respects, um, can remember this and 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 remember what the right formulation is. It again, this is one of those things that will come up again later, and this may not be the right place to correct it, but it's the first place it comes up. So we do have language um, in condition F8 that talks about stacked parking. Um, uh, the applicant shall provide 114 long-term bicycle parking spaces that are covered and secure. Such spaces may be stacked parking spaces so long as mechanical assistance is provided for the spaces on the upper racks. And that's a consistent with the waiver request as well. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair. Please. Um, I just pulled up my notes from July 26th when we talked about this mm -hmm. and um, you know, what I what I wrote was the applicants are agreeable to this condition, but would like it stated more generally. Okay. We settled on stacked bicycle parking with mechanical assist for the upper level. Perfect. Great. Yeah, so I think the first reference we have in regards to parking. Uh, to bike parking is that is a finding on number 35, uh, which just documents the park, the amount of parking. And then in condition F8, we're more deliberate about the how those spaces are to be carried out. It can include a sentence on 35, the applicant proposes mechanical lift assistance for upper level stacks. I think that would be a good addition. That sounds fine. And 
then the next <clears throat> note I had was um, in the conditions under section B, B1 would just be a comma after the word agency in the first line. So allowed by the subsidizing agency, mass housing, or other subsidizing agency. I think that's how that's supposed to read. Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. Uh, would you just scroll down? We're still up at 31. Oh, beg your pardon. Thank you. I've, I've got it on two screens. I'm looking at the wrong one. Oops. Now it's going to go way past. Come on. There we go. This Acceptance may otherwise be allowed by the subsidizing agency, mass housing, or other subsidizing agency. Then the my next comment was in section E. E27 is just a correction of the spelling of Anessi. It should be A N N E S E. Before we get to that one, Mr. Chairman, there is actually comments on page 16. Under D, this has to do with the cultivars uh, question oh, okay. that raised earlier. All right. Mr. Chairman, if I could, um, I expressed a concern several <clears throat> times during the hearing regarding um, my sense of, re regarding native plants, which we yeah. sort of touched on earlier, but this is the primary way it comes up. Um, and what I would propose is including the following sentence after Conservation Commission in, uh, this is in D actually, um, following the long list of the little Roman numerals. So the paragraph begins, all planning shall consist, if you can follow that. Yes, um, I'd include the words after Conservation Commission, cultivars of native plants may be used as reasonably necessary to achieve the landscape design slash plan submitted to the Conservation Commission. Um, and so the reason for that, there's, I had remembered vaguely that there was a letter from Ms. O'Connor that raised this issue. And I found that letter, it's uh, the letter of July 19th, 2021 in the first point. Uh, and the applicant at that point suggested um, or pointed, suggested deleting the reference to uh, the Con Conservation Commission's approved plan because it, Mr. Connor said that their expert their expert said that the um, that they would need cultivars in order to in order to actually comply with the plan that they gave to the Conservation Commission. Um, so that leaves us with the awkward situation of whether we should stick with not having cultivars at least mentioned or, or authorized, um, in which case the conservation plan uh, the, might, that was prevented to the commission might not be doable, um, or to include a reference to the cultivars uh, and uh, which, which does make it doable. Um, and it seems to me that the real in, the intention of the Conservation Commission would be to have the plan that was presented to them actually done. Um, and that would uh, require language that was un not unduly strict about um, that might be interpreted as prohibiting the cultivars of native species. Um, and so I'm proposing to clarify this in such a way as to allow uh, the applicant actually to um, uh, comply with the plans that were presented to the con to the conservation commission. I have no objection to that. Mr. 
Mr. Tanner, do you have other comments before section E? Um, no, I don't. We have some in section E before we get to E27. Okay. Right, there is there is one in section E. So <coughs> we can get to E6. I'm not sure if there's anything before that. Okay. Um, so with E6, I would propose after in the third line up from the bottom uh, to include as a parenthetical uh, or shared private way and parenthesis um, in order to use language that is broad enough to include Writer Street. Uh, that technically is not a public way. Um, but it functions as if it is. And I think that the policy here ought to be to uh, uh, prevent that street uh, from being encumbered with mud and soil uh, as much as Mass Ave. So uh, I think this language uh, accomplishes that. Okay. And you said that was for E6? Yes. <clears throat> So control and minimize dust on the site and adjacent roadways during construction. That's essentially the. In the last sentence, it would be the applicant shall keep all portions of any public way or shared private way used as ac access or egress to the project free of soil, mud, or debris deposited due to, due to use by construction vehicles associated with the project. That's well taken. Anything else ahead of E27? Um, no, I pass. I just wanted to point out that in E17 is the first time that we, in more or less similar ways, address snow on site. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it's probably more trouble than it's worth to consolidate all of that. So I'm taking a pass. But if anyone feels uncomfortable with it, uh, we do more or less say the same thing in three different places. I think they all essentially they're all essentially the same. So as long as they're not contradictory, I think we're okay. I think that's I think that's true. I you hate to say things multiple times for fear that that what doesn't seem controversy now will seem contradictory later on, but I think that we're pretty safe, on pretty safe grounds with this, these particular ones. Mr. Chairman? Mr. DuPont. Good, uh, my, uh, my uh, microphone's been bugging out, so I oh, apologize, sorry. but um, just before the start of E, uh, so I, I have it on page 19, I think it's the right page, um, and it was, it was B. Yeah just before it and we're I was just, just curious because it says the applicant shall provide to the board evidence of a property management plan and I'm wondering why we're just not requesting a property uh, management plan so just so that it would read shall provide to the board a property management plan is it just because it's going to be too voluminous <clears throat> that we would want evidence meaning what a summary or some something along those lines so I'd prefer to see the plan if it's not too uh, awkward to actually have it provided. Well, I don't think it's too awkward. That makes sense. Okay. Right. So this should read, the applicant shall provide to the board a property management plan if property management will be done in house. Correct. Or shall provide a copy of a contract. Exactly. <laughs> Good. Again, E27 with just the spelling of Anessi, there should be A double N E S E. And then I had on F4. Um, sub C, and I would just ask Mr. Revelek to just take a look at this as well. Um, 
because we had we were looking for a mechanism to submit electronically comments to the property manager, but I don't think this quite captures uh, what was proposed last time. And I just want to pass that back to Mr. Revelak to see what Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman, I, I mean, I, I also have submitted <clears throat> language to Mr. Haverty that mm -hmm. attempted to address that. So Ooh, okay. what was your recommendation? Um, re rephrasing C to say, provide both a telephone number and a method for electronic submissions for residents to report potential infractions to the property manager. Sounds good to me, Mr. Revac. Does that address the concern we were trying to address? I believe it does. Okay. Last little thing I had was it seems there's a space before the word parking in F12. At that, and uh, Patrick also had a modification. Uh, yes, I actually, the, the I was a little bit concerned with uh, in the second line to discourage motor vehicle mm -hmm. ownership in the project, which seemed to me to be not quite getting at the right concept. Uh, Mr. Haverty suggested how about uh, to say, uh, to discourage motor vehicle ownership um, by residents of the project. And that seems to capture what the right idea is. That seems to work. Are there any other questions or comments? in regards to everything up through the up through um, F13. Oh, okay. So that is where we left off last time. This is at the start of G. Um, the I guess my last question under F <laughs> um, was we don't mention anything in here about um, transportation demand management specifically. Um, and I just want to confirm with everyone that that was correct. Mr. Chairman. Yeah. My recollection is that the, the applicant did propose a traffic demand management plan. And I wonder, it's, I think it's a good catch. I, I wonder, I don't know of any point where they backed away from it. And it seemed to me that it was a, that it was a good idea and a well thought out plan. Mm -hmm. um, I'll have to see if we can locate. A condition the applicant shall comply with the traffic management plan proposed and submitted to the board during the course of the public hearing. That works. That works to me. Yeah, I like it. That'll be F14. And so starting with G on page 26, uh, police fire and emergency medical conditions. Um, under G2, um, I just wanted to change it so it would read stairwells and garages must be minimum two hour fire rated. Residential units must be minimum one hour fire rated. Chairman? Yes, please. So in G1, and I don't know that it matters all that much, but where we say that they'll provide management and maintenance personnel during typical business hours, mm -hmm. um, is that sort of understood what those are or would it be 
advisable to put in between the hours of such and such and such and such. Maybe it's too directive, but I just, as I was reading it, I didn't know what typical business hours would mean for this type of a, uh, you know, a development. So just throwing that out is really a question. Mr. Haverty, do you think that's unclear? I mean, I, I guess typical, typical business hours historically have been presumed to be nine to five. I don't know. And I have no problem. Reflecting current reality. Yeah, yeah right. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, if, if that's understood, that's fine. I just didn't know if um, we wanted, it, as long as they're operating in good faith and they make sure they get personnel where they need them and when they need them, that's fine. So I just, uh, I wouldn't want to see somebody say, I'm sorry, we're here from one to two uh, every day. Mm -hmm. You know, that's all. Instead of typical, would regular be a better term? I don't think there's a fundamental difference. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm fine I was, as it is. I just wanted to raise the, the question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I was going to suggest typical daytime business hours, but that probably doesn't make much of a difference. Okay. Okay. Let's just go ahead and leave it as is. The next comment I had was on G8. Are there any comments between G1 and G7? Hearing none. Um, so I'd originally flagged this because I thought it was redundant with G1, but now that looking at it again, G1 is during regular operation and G8 is specifically during construction. So I think that's okay. Mr. Chairman, again, um, on that point. Yeah. Uh, during construction, I was reading that and I was wondering what sort of signals the termination of construction? Is it the issuance of a certificate of occupancy? That's a fair question. I'm not sure that even when you get to the CO point, you still sometimes have construction activities ongoing. Right. Um, and I think it's really probably until final sign-offs. Yeah, until the sign, to the, the, yeah, because you can get a temporary certificate of occupancy in which case you're not totally complete, but you're still working on some aspects of the project, but a final certificate of occupancy, you would have to have complete sign off. Again, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Yeah. Mr. Hanlon. Uh, this is one of those things where I think the practicalities will help solve the problem. Uh, because if there's the purpose of this is to make sure that there's somebody to receive complaints or information regarding construction activities. The, there won't be such complaints unless there are construction activities. Mm -hmm. And so the applicant the, will know perfectly well whether, I mean, if it happens that somebody is trying to reach a construction manager because of construction and somebody is not there, that will in itself be evidence that there's a violation of this condition. So it may be that figuring out a precise way of, of terminating this obligation is a little bit self-defeating really it's ultimately if you're doing construction you want to have a construction superintendent there period mm -hmm. yep. i'm fine with that okay moving on to page 27 um in g9 uh it says i was wondering if the, in the first line if the word project is correct or whether it should be property so during construction, the project involving all structures shall be accessible or whether it should be the project, including all structures shall be accessible. I think it can be the property. I mean, all structures would include everything that's constructed you know, as part of the project. Okay. I would, ch I would recommend changing it to property just because yep. Are there any other comments on the on section G? None. 
Moving on to section H on water, sewer, and utilities. Uh, my first question was in section H4. Are there any questions on H1, 2, or 3? Uh, so under H4, it says the service size for the domestic water service should be verified by the water and sewer division. Um, should it, is should correct or it, should it be a shall? You shall probably. And again, in line three, there's an, a similar requirements should becoming requirements shall. Are there any other comments through H5? Seeing none, moving on to page 28. Um, the first I have is H9. So is there any comments on H6, 7, or 8? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dupont. Yep. So I think in the line where it says that the applicant um, in conjunction with the utility companies shall request a grant of location. Don't we want them to obtain a grant of location? Because it's a necessity as far as I read that. So rather than request, I understand that all they can do is request and then await a decision, but don't they need to obtain this in order to move forward? So it would be for the public right of way um, and my, my understanding is that the, the utilities that they're installing are starting at an existing pole and are being located underground on the property. Right. I'm, I'm just, I am just reading the part where it says they're going to request a grant of location mm -hmm. from the select board. And so I would think that to finish the process, they need to actually obtain the grant of location, unless I'm misunderstanding. To obtain? Yeah. So would you say request and, request and obtain, or just say shall obtain a grant? I would just change request to obtain. That's okay. what I was thinking, thanks. And then in seven, if I may, Please. So where in the second sentence, it says that the town's not responsible for trash, recycling, compost, and or yard waste. I think that we should probably in the first sentence say that the applicant shall be responsible for all trash, um, recycling, and yard waste, just for consistency. So those, those same four that are listed in the second paragraph include all of those in the first paragraph, uh, excuse me, that are in the second sentence include yes. all those in the first sentence. Correct. So under H9, um, so this is the utility pole question. This, there's a, little, a lot to do here. Um, <clears throat> so I, in the one, two, three, four, five, six, in the starting in the sixth line that's all, if the applicant should continue to work to resolve this issue, including further exploration of relocating the pole further east, but within the right of way. And I'm wondering if that should say, but within the bounds of the property, uh, because there are portions of the property that are not, that are outside the right of way, but that are still on the property. Mr. Uh, Chair? Yes, please. I would. I'd suggest um, oh, where I just lost the language um, stopping after the word east. So if, for example, the applicants can work out uh, some sort of an arrangement where, you know, the pole is repositioned on an adjacent property, I, I think that should be acceptable to us. Okay. Mr. 
Mr. Chairman. Yes, please. It seems to me it's not only acceptable, but in some ways it's the preferred solution. Yes. Um, <laughs> I mean, certainly where the pole does not does not serve the property but serves the adjacent mm -hmm. properties uh. chairman yes please so in that same sentence is that another instance where should should be shall so applicant shall continue to work um I think it should be shown. Okay. I I also have a comment on the last sentence of H nine. Yep. So this is curious to hear what people think of this one because this was mine. Well, you first then. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I, I had, I, I've been looking, so we have been trying to, you know, it's sort of the stick and carrot approach to this issue. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my, my opinion has been all along that this poll is, is an accident waiting to happen. Um, and treating it as anything other than that, um, you know, is, is somehow disingenuous. So, Either the pole has to be relocated or it has to be made crashworthy. Um, and so what I have been, what I had sort of tried to do with the language here was to really push the, the pole relocation mm -hmm. and to basically say, you know, you don't have to relocate the pole. If you want to leave the pole where it is, that's fine, but you just can't use it as an entrance for the residents. Um, and so until such time as you move the pole, the residents have to go the other way around. Mm -hmm. um, so, Mr. Chair, I could agree with that. Like, as you said, I believe it is an, an accident waiting mm -hmm. to happen. But um, you know, the, the 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 what caught my attention was the applicant is limited to, limited to using Quinn Road for resident and staff access to the project. Mm -hmm. um, I think the right of way to Ryder Street should also be usable as an entrance. Not as an entrance. Ah. Right, because the language that's there now just talks about access, not just entrance. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. So I want to clarify that I, I had sort of intended where it says access to the project with, as sort of implying that it was for entrance. Mm -hmm. um, because certainly the, the existing uses that have access to that right of way, we don't want to um, prohibit those. It's really, we just don't want the increase in traffic. Right. Um, that would accompany the, the addition of residents. Um, and road is going to be available for access and egress to the project. And then Ryder Street would be available only for egress. Is that right? That's that is the correct. intent. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. the intent. Although I would say ingress and egress rather than access and egress. Right. <laughs> I prefer that as well, but for some reason, most people don't understand ingress. Oh, <laughs> so the question, the, the, uh, the other question that, um, you know, when we had been reviewing this earlier is should we provide for other alternatives that to right now, the way this is written is the poll has to be relocated. Um, and so if there is a, if there comes down that there's some fundamental reason that this poll cannot move and needs to remain where it is, are we comfortable as a board telling the applicant that they can't use that right of way for residents? Or do we want to um, provide a mechanism for them to come back, either come back to the board or to include something, some language in this decision that would allow them to seek an alternate, um, an alternate resolution? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hanlon, um, uh, we should rec recognize, of course, that the applicant can, if it has to, come back and seek a modification of the of the condition. Mm -hmm. So, in a situation where there's an extraordinary circumstance where they 
have a compelling case for why it is they need to provide this, this source of access. And they show that they've done everything remote they possibly could either to get the pole relocated or which, you know, is not just the utility, but also providing, you know, bargaining for the neighboring and related uh, property to allow that to happen. What I think I, is good about this language is that it provides a hammer. It's not best efforts and things like that. It, it says, look, you have to solve this problem. It's not good. Sometimes the college, good old college try just isn't enough. You have to actually score. And I think that that's the position that we ought to take here. Now, obviously, if they've done everything they can and they can show that it's a serious inconvenience to the residents and they have some other proposal that is helpful, they have they have an avenue under the law as it is. And, and we, we have the we would have the responsibility to take their argument seriously. Um, but I don't want to make it too easy. I, th I think that uh, it would be better to take a hard line on this. And then if we have to reconsider it later on, we should. Mm -hmm. Should we add a sentence at the end of this stating if the applicant is unable to come to a reasonable resolution on the poll relocation, the applicant may seek a modification of this decision Pursuant to 760 CMR 56.0511. Right. I, they, they, of course, can do that. I imagine whether we say that or not, but. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I would recommend changing uh, the word decision to condition. Well, it, it, yeah, it, it's, it would be a modification of the decision. Oh, okay. Even okay. though it's only addressing a particular condition. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Mills. Yes, Mr. Chairman, um, how are we actually going to limit them? Are we just going to tell them you can't use it and they're going to be on their word of honor and promise not to use it, all several hundred residents? That's, that's I mean, can we physically block it off or are we just going to tell them they can't use it? Um, I mean, certainly if it was the enforcement's an, an, an issue, um, you know, as the, you know, as the residents of Ryder Street rightly pointed out that, you know, it's one thing for us to say these things and to do it, um, but it's another to get the residents to actually abide by it. Um, so I don't know if we would, you know, in, we, if we would have to request signage to indicate this or how do we, how do we try to make this enforceable? Well, I think the the challenge of enforcement is not going to be very different than the no turn on no right on rider restriction. Um, you know, the applicants have stated that it, well, there there we know we've already discussed signage, mm -hmm. um, and the applicants have stated their intention to make it part of the policies. Um, you know, I mean at the. I think the best we can do, I, I think it would be reasonable to assume the applicants would do a similar thing for the Mass Ave right of way, but I would not see any harm in um, uh, some sort of signage requirement. Mr. Chairman. Yes, please. Um, I agree with that. I think that signage would be helpful there uh, as a kind of self-enforcement. I will point out that that this isn't one of those things where violations will go highly unnoticed. Uh, I, I'm quite confident that Mr. Anessi will notice uh, violations and will know what to do in order to in order to enforce the rights that that this gives. Um, and so I I feel less concerned about this just going on beneath the radar here than in some other instances. I mean, that's not personal to Mr. Anessi. It's just that right. there is a particular property that is more affected than anything, any other by this problem. And whoever, Mr. Anessi could sell that land and whoever occupies it will be in a position to complain in the event that, that it's being used contrary to the, uh, contrary to the provisions of the, of the special of the comprehensive mm -hmm. permit. Okay. So 
So the the second to last. So just to read through the read through the paragraph again. The second to last sentence reads: If it is finally determined that the pole cannot be relocated, the applicant prior to construction shall provide the board with a plan for mitigating safety and visibility issues related to the pole. And then we go on to say until such time as the pole is relocated. So is it, so we sort of say, if you can't relocate the pole, you have to do something to mitigate the safety and visibility issues related to the pole, but you still can't use the road. And it seems to me that we should be, <clears throat> that there's a contradiction there that we need to address. Mm -hmm. Because I think if they were able to, it seems that if the poll, if it is finally determined the poll cannot be relocated um, and the applicant does provide. Sentence really necessary if you're addressing the safety issues, you know, with the next sentence by mm -hmm. prohibiting the use. I, I'm sort of curious if the second to last sentence could simply be removed. Right. Mm -hmm. I think it could be. Because that, that, that second to last paragraph, the second to last sentence, excuse me, also requires action prior to construction, whereas the final sentence provides time really up until the issuance of the certificate of occupancy to address the issue. So they really have considerable amount of time to address the problem before they actually have residents and staff. Okay, so I, so just read through what we have here. Um, starting in the middle, uh, the applicant shall continue to work to resolve this issue, including further exploration of relocating the pole further east. Prior to initiating construction, the applicant shall provide the board with a written summary of the coordination efforts between the applicant and the utility owner regarding the relocation of the pole. Until such time as the pole is relocated and a minimum 18 foot right of way is provided, the applicant is limited to using Quinn Road for resident and staff uh, access to the project. And I know, I believe, Mr. Haverty, you have a revision to that sentence plus an additional sentence. So I have, until such time as the pole is relocated and the minimum 18 foot right of way is provided, the applicant is limited to using Quinn Road for resident and staff ingress and egress to the project and should be limited to using Ryder Street for egress to the project. Then I would also add the applicant shall install signage reflecting this condition until, and then in parentheses, if ever, such time that the pole has been relocated. And then finally, a, a final sentence, if the applicant is unable to come to a reasonable resolution on the pole relocation, the applicant may seek a modification of this decision pursuant to 760 CMR 56.05. That acceptable to everyone? It is to me. I, I, am, I'm, I am comfortable with that. Perfect. Mr. Mills is good. Mr. Ford, are you comfortable with that? Perfect. Okay. That moves us. Is there anything else in relation to water, sewer, and utilities? No, we'll move on to wetlands, floodplain, and environmental conditions. Section I. Um, any, anything on the I-1 and I-2 at the bottom of page 28? Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. Um, I'm wondering whether we need I-2. Uh, it seems to me to, uh, to uh, duplicate what we've already done in E-6 and E-20. I agree, this is duplicative. And we can go ahead and strike that. Okay, that brings us up to page 29. Yeah. 
you had questions on I-4 as well? Let's do our... Yeah, yeah Mr. My... Chairman, this is one where Mr. Haverty originally had was looking for some alternative language from staff, but uh, the, the beginning of E4 says that the applicant must hire a qualified environmental monitor with professional credentials to be selected by the board um, and to be on site during the dur duration of the project. Um, I was a little bit unclear as to whether or not the board is going to be selected, whether the environmental monitor is intended to be selected by the board. I wouldn't uh, include that language at all. The board okay. should not be selecting the environmental monitor that's going to be hired and paid for by the applicants. Okay. But they should have professional credentials. Yes. So Mr. Haverty, how would you have this language read? I, think I would say prior to the commencement of construction, the applicant must hire a qualified environmental monitor with appropriate professional credentials to be on site throughout the duration of the project. Great. That would mm -hmm. solve my problem. Uh, uh, and I guess I, I think that it's probably appropriate to limit it to having the environmental monitor on site when working within any jurisdictional area. I don't think they need to be, and, and I don't know how much of the site really isn't in jurisdictional areas, but if there's no work going on that requires them to be overseeing something, they really shouldn't be on the site. Yeah, I think certainly their, their um, applicability of the project changes once, all, once construction operations have moved indoors. Um, and so I think, yeah, if we could indicate that so that they are, that we would want them on site during phases of construction involving the jurisdictional areas, I think that would be a better, a better way to limit it. Mr. Chairman, mm -hmm. um, could we reflect a little more on that? When you read further down, uh, one of the uh, obligations is during the duration of the project to submit an electronic report after every rain event exceeding a certain amount um, and to report the condition of the site. Uh, and I think that it's not just a matter of working within the jurisdictional areas, but the possibility that something that happens in the site that might not be within the jurisdictional area will nevertheless have an impact on it, that this is part of what you wanna monitor. Um, and I'm not sure that we didn't have it right to begin with, that it would be a good thing to have these people on the, have the monitor on the site all the time to, uh, to do the monitoring and to provide impact, to provide information regarding impacts, uh, regardless of where the construction is at any given moment. Mm Yeah, I just would, I wouldn't want to. I'm, try, I'm trying to find a way to to work the language such that, you know, it's clear that you know we, we're looking to have an environmental monitor on site who is there while the site is open while they are doing work on the site. But essentially, once you know the site has been closed, you know, once the the building is under the ground and once the you know the ground is planted, that you know they're responsibilities are less than they are while you know the site is being excavated and such so i'm not quite sure how we work that is is does the second to the last sentence ad address that i mean presumably when you, the changes that you've described would be changes in site conditions that would allow for an adjustment if if a decrease in the duties of the environmental monitor were called for. I will point out that that as far as I remember, the applicant did not uh, didn't object to this condition. So, you know, the the I don't want to be unreasonable under the circumstances, but it was not one of those things that seems to have set off an alarm bell on the part of the applicant. I think they did. Actually. Oh, they did. 
my, my initial uh, marginal comment was from July 19th when the, the hearing was still open. And I think that was because the applicant expressed concern about how broad this condition was. Okay. And whether, you know, it was, it was basically requiring them to pay for an environmental monitor for times when they really wouldn't need it, wouldn't need to be on the site. I, I do think that there's really two different things going on here. You, know, you obviously want the environmental monitor on when there's any work going on within jurisdictional areas, but the, the provision requiring the report after every rain event exceeding 0.5 inches uh, in a 24 hour period is a separate issue. And it does really address the entire site. So I, I, I think you know, that, that there's no conflict between the proposed limitation language um, that I had suggested in this requirement requiring the reports for rain events exceeding 25 inches. I know another question had been raised about the frequency um, of the reporting. So there's a line, the monitor shall submit an electronic report to the ZBA weekly regarding construction progress relation to resource areas and shall state whether that such work is in their professional opinion in compliance with the comprehensive permit. Um, so the question as to whether weekly was appropriate or whether it should be bi-weekly or monthly. Um, this was the this was actually the air, the point that I had um, noted to to comment on. Um, I mean, I guess my big question is: Are reports is the issuance of a report that's more frequent than board meetings really useful? Right. Those staff would have the opportunity to review it if anything right. came up that needed to be addressed. Mm -hmm. I think that we need to recognize that when we say board here, we typically are referring to somebody other than us, although there are, they're acting as our agents, but they'll be the ones who, uh, who do this. So if the, if the hearing were still open, I'd be inquiring as to what the normal practice is. It seems to me that this shouldn't be something that that best practices are on, are impossible to determine. Mm -hmm. um, I'm assuming that this language came either from the conservation. I mean, originally uh, was requested by the conservation commission and or beta. And you know, if we want to, I, I I'm a little bit reluctant to relax it without a more compelling reason than than we have already it seems to me that that i have no reason to believe that this is unreasonable i mean it, it may be i could go along with i certainly could go along with mr haverty's suggestion as long as it doesn't as long as we can imagine that the construction monitoring and the Rain is is a different thing, but I wonder whether it's needed to do this. I I certainly would like to back the conservation commission up or whoever was the source of this. It would be one of those two bodies. Mm -hmm. um, in the absence of more of a determination than we have already, that it needs to be relaxed. It doesn't seem re unreasonable to me. But yes, looking at um, I pulled up my notes from July nineteenth where. Uh, we discuss this um, in the, the couple of sentences I, I jotted down where uh, the town typically requires environmental monitoring during the construction of larger complex projects. Emily Sullivan, town conservation planner, and Ms. Wynn Stanley O'Connor will work out language for monitoring requirements. The frequency of reporting is negotiable. The Conservation Commission's main concern is that erosion controls work during heavy rain. So That's I guess this, I guess this begs the question of uh, was this the language that uh, Attorney O'Connor, uh, Attorney Win Stanley O'Connor and Ms. Sullivan worked out? <laughs> I don't think it is. I, I think the, the marginal reference I have, you know, had left a placeholder for that, and I don't think mm -hmm. they have received anything because this is the same language, you know, that was there for you know. But I would note, you know, that the um, the language, you know, goes on to state 
The monitor shall submit an electronic report to the ZBA weekly regarding construction progress relation to resource areas. So I do think you know that the intent here is for the impact on the resource areas. I do think you know the limitation, you know, to, to having it only you know during construction within jurisdictional wetlands areas is sufficient, particularly when you bootstrap it with the reporting requirement for any rain event over 25 inches. Now hunting. Okay, here we go. So there was a there was definitely a request to delete this from the applicant um, in an earlier version. It was inserted initially by um, by the Department of Planning and Community Development. Would, is it possible to, Mr. Chairman, I wonder if, I, mean, I, I it's hard for us to sit here and figure out what, and, and essentially figure out what it is that Ms. Sullivan and Ms. O'Connor might have come to if they'd, if they'd actually submitted the language to us. Um, and I wonder if, the, if it's possible just, it seems to me that that what Mr. Revelax notes reflect is the possibility that these de that there is more than one reasonable way to do this, and I wonder if we can figure out a way of simply organizing, you know, requiring a plan that provides, you know, uh, that provides a, a frequency that is subject to the approval of the board or approve, which ultimately would be the planning department. Um, and you know, if they haven't worked it out already, they can work it out afterwards. The and we and the condition could to, could try to do what it could to limit itself to the essential rather than getting too, too deeply into the details. We could certainly do that. Oh, my my question would be: Does that create an issue where it's difficult for the applicant to determine what the actual cost of the condition is. Well, it does do that. But I think that, you know, given given the information we have, you know, short of reopening the the public hearing, which I think we would prefer to avoid, I think we need to come up with a yeah. way that is gives some leeway to the board and the applicant for coming up with a you know a proposed schedule for. The environmental monitor. I think we're in agreement that we want to have the environmental monitor. It really comes down to the question as to what the the frequency of their time on site is, um, and how often they have to file reports. So I I have I'll I'll throw out a suggestion. Please. Uh, so we start prior to commencement of construction. The applicant must hire a qualified environmental monitor with professional cr credentials to provide environment to provide environmental monitoring at a. You know, basically, I'm well, roughly, mm -hmm. I'm thinking strike the sentence and to or the strike the clause and to be on site throughout the duration of the project. Yep. So we we say that the the applicant so that you know the applicant has to hire one. Um, the monitor shall submit an electronic report to the ZBA weekly. That could be fine. And there's also we also have the requirement that during the duration of the project, uh, the monitor 
submit an electronic report after every basically heavy rain event. Um, the language, all right. I, I think those three things kind of get at what we want and would provide the applicant some flexibility. I suppose we could we could note the environmental monitor with professional credentials to be available or on site <laughs> with sufficient frequency to, to prepare, you know, to with sufficient frequency to to well I think Jim yes, go ahead. I was going to say if you just said to be available throughout the duration of the project. Mm -hmm. um, I think that might do it um, because, you know, they will have to be on site to, you know, to at least prepare reports according to the reporting frequency, the weekly reporting frequency and the after every heavy rain event frequency. Right. So we can say prior to the commencement of construction, the applicant must hire a qualified environmental monitor with professional credentials to be on to be available throughout the duration of the project. Um, this period shall begin when siltation controls are installed and shall end with the issuance of a certificate of compliance. The, mo the monitor shall submit an electronic report to the Zoning Board of Appeals weekly regarding construction progress, relation to resource areas, and she'll state whether the work is in their professional opinion in compliance with the comprehensive permit. During the duration of the project, the environmental, the qualified environmental monitor shall also submit an electronic report after each rain event exceeding one half inch of rain in the 24 hour period to the ZBA regarding the condition of the site during and after the rain event, as well as the status of erosion controls and any additional measures to address stormwater management issues caused by said rain event. The ZBA reserves the right to change the frequency of inspections based on contractor performance, weather or site conditions, all materials required. Be submitted to the ZBA shall also be submitted to the environmental monitor. Essentially, we are just in the second, at the end of the second line, removing uh, be selected by the board and, and then changing the term on site to available. Mm -hmm. And you might, Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Hanlon. Well, the I mean, I, I actually, when when the chair just read the language, I began getting a little bit nervous because I mean, the first duty of the monitor, the first listed duty, is to provide an opinion as to whether the as to whether the appli the applicant is in co in compliance with the comprehensive permit, um, and being available is not a sufficient guarantee that you can that you can make that judgment. Uh, I think that's why it was originally that there was a concept of an on-site on -site presence. Um, so I'm a little bit nervous now in a way that I wasn't three minutes ago uh, about deleting the necessity of being uh, on-site. Maybe, maybe it would be easier. I mean, I'm not sure what would we lose really if it was bi-weekly or even every three weeks rather than every week, maybe the way to release that. Because, you know, the second to the last sentence suggests to me at least that if contractor performance is sketchy, the frequency of inspection can be increased, uh, which suggests that we might not start by having a maximum frequency and, uh, and adjust depending upon, depending upon the performance of the, of the contractor. But I'm just not sure that that somebody who's merely available is going to adequately adequately be able to uh, issue the opinion on the performance of the contractor that is required by the first condition here. So Mr. We, Chair, do we want to include a provision that actually states how many you know how frequently they have to visit the site. I mean, the way it reads now, it's almost like they have to be there at all times during construction. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that was really the main concern of the applicant and it does impose a pretty heavy um, financial obligation to do that. Whereas they're going to have to be visiting the site with some frequency if they're going to be providing these weekly or bi-weekly reports. Mm -hmm. Obviously not able to prepare a report without 
visiting the site and observing firsthand. Mr. Chairman? Yes, please, Mr. Ford. Th this language is not unlike um, common inspection requirements on construction projects, such as um, um, <clears throat> welding inspections, which we require 100% inspections on all uh, moment welds, for example. But we, and it requires a continuous inspection. And it is commonly accepted practice that continuous doesn't mean on site 100% of the time. It means that they're out there at a frequency where they can monitor and, and manage uh, the inspection process, but it by no means means 100% of the time. And it is also fairly common for um, us to start a project requiring 100% inspection of welds, but it, there's a, a provision that allows them if, you know, if, if um, at the beginning of the project, the inspections are coming back um, always positive, we can relax it after a period of time. Mm -hmm. So because a lot of it has to do with the quality of the subcontractors that they hire to do the work, because it's really about making sure that the subcontractors, and I'm using the analogy of, of of another uh, sub, uh, uh, subcontractor, it's really about making sure you have quality people doing the work. That, that's really what we're doing. Like if we ensure that it was a good contractor, they're gonna be on top of this, whether we're out there or not. But this provision really has to do with more about making sure that, the, that we're holding the owner accountable to hire somebody that's qualified as a contractor to do the work. So my, my, my suggestion might be not to deviate too much, and you know, permit that. Um, I'll let you wordsmiths figure out how to write it, but permit that we can revisit it after a period of time. Um, and and as far as the you know, being a continuous on site, that doesn't to me mean at least it's not common <clears throat> uh, understood to mean somebody's out there uh, eight hours a day or ten hours a day. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes, please. So uh, uh, along the lines of what Mr. Hanlon said, I, I agree the word available uh, is a little bit too squishy, or that's my take. And then in keeping or in line with what Mr. Ford just said, I'm wondering if in that sentence where you say must hire a qualified monitor with professional credentials, um, it, rather than referencing the frequency of how often they're there, but to continuously monitor the site through the throughout the duration of the project. So, so it's more focused on the the act of monitoring than it is the actual number of hours or days that are present. Mm -hmm. So, just a thought. So, mm -hmm. use, using the word monitor. Uh, monitor the site throughout the duration of the project, then it's sort of up to them in their professional sort of judgment with professional standards, I would guess, to figure out what they need to do in order to submit those weekly or biweekly reports. No, I think that's been it. I think it addresses the, the, the point that Mr. Ford made that you know, when you're saying continuously monitor, we're not talking about that you have to be there every second of every day monitoring it, but that you have to be aware, you have to have situational awareness of what's going on. Yes. At all times. So that we will be looking to adjust the first sentence to read, prior to the commencement of construction, the applicant must hire a qualified environmental monitor with professional credentials to continuously monitor the site throughout the duration of the project. That's what I was thinking. Yes. Okay. But then that, yeah. again, it's the continuously that could create some problems. So how about we, we go with prior to the commencement of construction, hire a qualified environmental monitor with appropriate professional credentials to provide monitoring throughout the duration of the project. Or how about to provide continuing monitoring? So it, it's a little bit different than continuously. 
because I think you're right. I think continuously might suggest being out there all the time. What did you say? Ongoing, maybe? Ongoing, yes. maybe? Yeah, ongoing is good. Well, just to relate it to common practice uh, for inspections, for all inspection activities on a project, the two terms are continuous or periodic. And um, I probably wouldn't deviate from continuous only because it is a common language for inspections. And this to me is, is sure seems like an inspection because you're wanting to make sure that the quality um, and the care taken is stays high. I, I don't think they'll, I don't think they'll push back, especially if we tie it to common terminology for inspection processes during construction. I mean, that's my feeling. I, I don't think I would sweat the, that word too much. Mr. Chairman, if I could just add that, I, I, it seems to me that if there's a generally understood meaning of the word continuous in the in the industry, mm -hmm. um, that that ought to take care of the possibility mm -hmm. that it would be overread by a layman that's not familiar with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so I will tell you my experience with with similar wording. Mm -hmm. in a town where I actually represented the board um, and the, the permit was appealed to the Housing Appeals Committee and there was a requirement for continuous video monitoring of the site. And the applicant took that to mean that somebody actually had to be sitting in front of a video screen 24 hours a day monitoring the site. In the appeal representing the board, I said you know, that that was not the intention of the condition and that it just means that they had, you know, the videos had to be running 24 hours a day so that if an incident occurs, they can go back and actually review the tape and, and find out what happened. And the Housing Appeals Committee said, nope, your decision says continuously, therefore it requires someone to be watching that video screen 24 hours per day. And therefore the expense associated with that was attributable to the board's decision. So that's sort of why I'm having some hesitancy with this language. Mm -hmm. I, I think whatever we include, we need to be precise and not rely upon a, a common understanding because I, I thought the language of that other decision was very clear and it was interpreted in, in a way that I never would have thought would have been interpreted. Mr. Chairman, okay, if I just read something, maybe I don't know that yeah. this is going to help or or not or or complicate it, but I just um, pulled up um, from the case guide, and um, th this this is just somebody uh, a group and uh, that over that um, that are are part of uh, the oversight in the construction industry, and so periodic versus in continuous inspection. The question is. Uh, about periodic versus continuous inspection. It says the IBC, which is the International Building Code, specifies the frequency of each inspection task as either periodic or continuous. The BOCA and the UBC codes, the older codes that were replaced by the International Building Code, left, so the IBC replaced the UBC and the BOCA code. So, so it's answering you know, what they didn't do in the past. So I'll, I'll read it again. The BOCA and UBC codes left the determination of the frequency of testing up to the registered design professional that specified the special inspection program. When continuous inspection is required, 100% of the work must be inspected and it must be inspected as the work is being performed. When periodic inspection is indicated, inspection of less than 100% of the work may be acceptable. The registered design professional when preparing a statement of special inspection should indicate the frequency of inspection that is required. The frequency of inspection varies depending on the size and complexity of the project. And I guess my point is that, um, the, uh, that there's really two common forms of inspection. And this to me is an inspection. And and I, Ms. Travity, I, I can, understand your experience um and so i'm not 
arguing that. I, I'm I'm just trying to suggest that I, I don't think I would replace the word continuous with anything other than than that because if I feel that it has a strong meaning in the inspections world. Mr. Ford, can you read that again? Because from what I heard, it seemed to suggest that continuous meant it has to be observed as the work is occurring, which would then mean the monitor would have to be there at all times during construction. Sure. <clears throat> um, so the title of this particular paragraph says periodic versus continuous and uh, periodic versus continuous inspection. The IBC specifies the frequency of each inspection task as either periodic or continuous. The BOCA and UBC codes left the determination of the frequency of testing up to the registered design professional that specified the special inspections program. When continuous inspection is required, 100% of the work must be inspected and it must be inspected as the work is being performed. When periodic inspection is indicated, inspection of less than 100% of the work may be acceptable. The registered design professional when preparing the statement of special inspection should indicate the frequency of inspection that is required. The frequency of inspection varies depending on the size and complexity of the projects. And, and I will follow that a common uh, uh, um, construction technique that requires 100% um, inspection is the construction of CME walls. So that's an activity that um, is an ongoing thing that starts in the morning and ends at night. And it just, you know, they're laying bricks and putting reinforcing. And it is very common that um, that we are asked, does, does uh, all of my colleagues in the industry are asked that 100% inspection, does that mean that I need an inspector observing every cell and every piece of rebar that goes in the wall? And the answer is, is always no. The intent of the code for this continuous inspection is that they are monitoring the quality on a regular ongoing basis. So whether that's daily or twice a day or once every other day, they're familiar with the construction of the wall and the quality as it goes up, as opposed to, you know, bouncing in and out every three weeks, once at the beginning of the wall and once at the end. So, Mr. Ford, I wonder you the uh, I, it, when you said what it really means is to monitor on a regular ongoing basis. Maybe the term regular ongoing basis itself is less subject to misinterpretation by the HAC and would and would provide a way of, of achieving what you've suggested without using a word that we already have some evidence that the HAC doesn't necessarily understand. Okay, makes sense. we have a draft of what that would look like? Prior to the commencement of construction, the applicant must hire a qualified environmental monitor with appropriate professional cred credentials to provide monitoring on a regular ongoing basis throughout the duration of the work. That sounds good to me. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, sounds good. With that in mind, the Submittal of the electronic report, do we want to maintain that as weekly or do we want to change that period? Mr. Sure. Chairman, you know, I, I, I really like the last, the second to the last line. It seems to me that what we do is start off with something reasonable mm -hmm. um, that, and, you know, it can be relaxed if, if it show. I mean, if uh, for the reasons that Mr. Ford originally suggested, and if we're and if the initial monitoring is showing problems, you would want to increase the frequency. And it seems to me that that we ought to leave the flexibility to adjust that. And that, in a way, the second to the last sentence, I think, is intended to do just that. Um, mm -hmm. And I wonder if Mr. Ford could look at that and see whether that seems to meet the the need for you know fine tuning, uh, depending upon the experience of the monitor. Mr. Hanel, what part did you want me to? Take the last, a... the second, the sentence. Oh goodness, I began to. Second to last, I think. 
It's the, the ZBA reserves the right to change the frequency of inspections based on contractor performance, weather or site conditions. And I, I understood at least the contractor performance as addressing the consideration that you initially mentioned when you were describing in inspections that if everything is coming back perfectly, you can sort of dial back Relax a little it. bit. And yeah. if everything isn't coming, isn't, then, then you may increase. I, I don't know. I mean, for me, bi-weekly and weekly, I have no basis of experience to tell me whether or not one is materially better than the other. Um, but I do think if it's adjustable, we can start pretty much anywhere and, and get to the right point with if people are being reasonable. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the, the, the way we have it worded right now, um, it, it and, and leaving it at a weekly starting point, I mean, it it puts, I, I like it the way it is. I, I wouldn't change weekly to anything other at the moment. I mean, it may feel like a lot, but w as long as we relay the intent that, you know, uh, if, as soon as we can see that you've hired a qualified contractor that that's, you know, has the, has our interest to, to take care of the, the surrounding property, and, and, and as soon as it's uh, proved and, and backed up by the reports that we're getting, you know, we're willing to relax it, but not until we see that, that, uh, see that it's happening on a regular basis at the beginning. Okay. So Mr. Chairman, if I could just sort of add to that, that maybe it would be, if we just changed the, the instead of saying reserves the right to, which suggests that the only thing what we're doing is reserving the right to make things tougher. Uh, maybe we should just say the ZBA may change the frequency of inspections, and that makes it more obvious that that we could both relax or tighten up depending on the on experience. Mr. Chairman. Yes, please. So I'm just wondering too if in that sentence it it could read change the frequency of inspections and reports. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so we're talking about changing the first sentence as was recently read and then changing the second to last sentence to the ZBA may change the frequency of inspections and reports based on contractor performance, weather or site condition. And we just those two changes to I four. Is that correct? Right. right. So, Mr. Chairman, just to go from the sublime to the ridiculous, but we should follow a consistent practice in whether or not we capitalize environmental monitor. And that should be lowercase in that last sentence. Mr. Haverty, can you just read that first sentence one more time for us? Certainly. Prior to the commencement of construction, the applicant must hire a qualified environmental monitor with appropriate professional credentials to provide monitoring on a regular ongoing basis throughout the duration of the project. Okay. Is that acceptable to everyone? Yep. I like it. Yep. Perfect. Thank you all. Okay. That brings us down to I-5. Um, there are any comments to I-5 or I-6? Okay, I-7 um, <clears throat> deals with fertilizer. Um, the application should only treat the planted area as a resource area with slow release nitrogen fertilizer. Application of fertilizer cannot occur in the summer or after storm events. Lawn fertilizer shall only be applied twice a year in spring and fall. Um, I had, I think we had previously, a, there was a question to the um, Conservation Commission about whether, you know, if they put in, if they install the lawn at a time that is not the spring or the fall, can they still apply fertilizer at that time? Um, and so I had asked um, the conservation, I had asked Ms. Chapnick about this 
um, in her sense was that the, you know, as an on, in an ongoing basis, you definitely don't want to be fertilizing outside of these times. But for the first year, when you're first getting the plants established, it may make sense to fertilize at other times. Um, and so I don't know if that's something that we want to address here or if we want to just leave it as it is. Had a parenthetical at the end of that sentence, except for during the initial planting of the lawn. The application of the fertilizer cannot occur. So. It was a lawn fertilizer shall only be applied twice a year in spring and fall, and then in parentheses, yeah, except for during the initial planting of the lawn, except during the initial planting year. Yeah. Is everyone comfortable with that? So where does the? I mean, we we. Even in the initial planning year, it can't be in storm events, right after storm events, correct? Correct. That would be, that's in a different sentence. Okay. So, yes, yeah, so we would just change. So, lawn fertilizer shall only be applied twice a year in spring and fall, except dur during the planting year. Is that consistent with? Guess I don't really understand the difference between the second sentence and the third sentence in that paragraph. Both of them are talking about the application of fertilizer, right? Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I see what you're saying, Patrick. Um, I think application of this fertilizer cannot occur in the summer in the second sentence is probably unnecessary. Well, that would be reasonable. Then it would just refer to the storm events and then the Correct. season would be entirely in the next sentence. That would be- But the, I'm curious now if the first two sentences apply specifically to plantings within the resource area and then the third sentence is specifically in regards to the lawn. Oh, maybe. Okay, I see what you're saying. I'm gonna leave that sentence the way it is then. Okay. Yep. Kind of read it, read the second sentence, application of this fertilizer. Mm -hmm. um, this fertilizer right. I think of as the fertilizer in the first sentence. Yeah. Yep. yep. Right. Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. <clears throat> the sentence, no other herbicides or treatment methods are approved. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't make a previous uh, reference to herbicides, so I don't think the word other is called for. Mm. May we say no herbicides or other treatment? Or the use of herbicides you know, instead of, instead of no other, just say the use of herbicides or similar treatment methods are not approved. Oh, I see. It's just a, it's just a very rough sentence. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to presume that the no other herbicides applies to compliance with 330 CMR 31.00. And if it's a herbicide that's list, listed in that, section, then it is approved. It's just no other herbicides are approved. Let me just yeah. pull that section up. If you think it's in that 330, Paul, I'm fine with it. Yeah, let me just look it up.
<clears throat> herbicides in here. Herbicide is not a defined term. This does this appears to deal just with plant nutrients, not with herbicides. Yeah. But are we prohibiting the use of herbicides on the site? That sentence seems to imply that no other herbicides or treatment methods are approved. But I'm not, yeah, I'm not clear on what herbicides are approved. Yeah. Oh. So do we want to limit the use of all herbicides on the site or just within uh, the resource areas? I, mean, I think we would. I mean, effectively, the whole site is basically within a resource area. Okay. Given that 330 CMR31 does not talk about herbicides, mm -hmm. I, I agree that the word other in front of herbicides is extraneous. Um, but how about no herbicides or other treatment methods are approved? Works for me. It's, I mean, it's interesting that the, the condition prohibits the use of pesticides or rodenticides within resource areas. Mm -hmm. But we're going to bar herbicides throughout the, the site. And I think that pesticides and rodenticides mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. more of a concern than herbicides. Oh, I agree. I mean, that, that language has been in, <laughs> bless you, that language has been in all along. Yeah, the Conservation Commission. All right, I have, a, all right, I have another idea. Okay. So, um, so after 330 CMR 31, mm -hmm. Um, no other treatment methods are approved. Yeah. And then in the next sentence, no pesticides, herbicides, or rodenticides shall be used to treat. Oh, no, treat pests. Oh, that. <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> <laughs> well, but why wouldn't you just, why wouldn't you just eliminate the treat pest management issues? Yes. I mean, no pesticides or rodenticides. I don't know why, what other use you would have for them. But even if you did have a different use, it wouldn't be allowed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we go back to Steve's comment. Just we take out uh, pest management. Yeah. So we would say no other treatment methods are approved. No pesticides, rodenticides, or herbicides shall be used within resource areas. Looks good to me. Mm -hmm. So what do we, Mr. Chairman, what does it mean to say no other treatment method shall be used there? What, I mean, we're, the next sentence is now prohibiting herbicides and pesticides and rodenticides. And up to that, we've talked about nu nutrients. Mm -hmm. What, I mean, originally the other treatment methods were, it was thought of as, as applying to something that is like what an herbicide might do, I suppose. Um, and I guess I don't know when we keep the sentence in there, no uh, treatment uh, no, about not treatment me methods not being approved. Mm -hmm. I don't know what we're driving at. I think it means that no treatment methods that are not in compliance with 330 CMR 31. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, maybe, oh, I okay. 
Maybe to make that clear, um, we could say 330 CMR 31 semicolon, no other treatment methods are approved. I guess I don't really understand what that adds to saying shall otherwise comply with. But I mean, if, if you think little, that it's important. Yeah, I'm a little nervous about drifting too, too far from Conservation Commission's language. I mean, as, as written, the yeah, the Conservation Commission didn't flag it as being an issue. I'm wondering if maybe we just leave it as is and not monkey with it. At Except all. for then it potentially allows herbicides mm -hmm. in resource areas. Oh, I see what you're saying. Well, no herbicides will be allowed anywhere, whether it's in a resource area or not. Well, it says no other herbicide mm, oh, other. treatment methods are approved, which suggests that there must be some herbicide treatment measures. Mm -hmm. I think this is probably a safer approach. Okay. So then per the previous recommendations, it would be the application of plant nutrients shall otherwise comply with 330 CMR 31.00 semicolon, other treatment method, no other treatment methods are approved, and then no pesticides, rodenticides, or herbicides shall be used to treat pest management issues within resource areas? No, we're going to get rid of the pest management issues and okay. just say shall be used within resource areas. Okay. But do we want to limit herbicides to only not being allowed in resource areas or do we not want them to be used anywhere? Absent a local requirement prohibiting the use of herbicides outside of resource areas, I, I'm not sure it's really within your authority to require it. Anyways. Okay. I, I feel comfortable treating the, the, the three things, rodenticides, mm -hmm. herbicides, and whatever the other one was, pesticides, <laughs> the, the same. All right. I mean, basically the, the, the principle is no poisons within resource areas. Yeah, exactly. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So do we think we have that now in a form where that's acceptable to us? I think so. If Mr. Haverty thinks so, he's no, the only one who I think really knows exactly what we've just decided. I'm fine with it. You okay. Know, it. Yep. Right. Anything else on page 29? On to page 30. Um, I know I-13, we have stuff on, but is there anything ahead of I-13? So I-13 contains the term cultivars again. And so per what Mr. Hanlon had noted before, I think we just strike the word no. So, Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman, I, I've got some language that I'm hoping might. Well, okay. no, I'm sorry. This it relates to a different issue. I think that striking what I would suggest uh, that I think just striking no cultivars of native planting shall be allowed. That's if you just strike that sentence, we should be okay, right? Okay. Yeah, I think that would be fine too. Excuse me. What does that sentence mean? No cultivars of native plantings. What is a cultivar of a native planting? Does anybody know? Well, I, I'm certainly not an expert on that subject. I had the sense that what it was is that it's is that it's a, sort of a biological derivative of it. Uh, and okay. with that in mind, Pat, I think what they may have been saying is some of the cultivars are non-pollinating. Um, versions of native plants. So they may be native, but they don't support uh, bee populations and pollinators per se. 
So I am not comfortable eliminating that sentence. I do believe uh, there was a purpose in that. Uh, I think that just a, the the reason for it and the I mean it's awkward because of course I I do have knowledge of of things that are outside our record so I'm trying to set that aside uh, but my the same principle is applicable here as was applicable at, at an earlier change um, it is apparently true uh, and the the submission that was made to us on July 19th says that in order to be able to do to do the plan that the applicant gave to the Conservation Commission, they needed to be able to use cultivars and that that was inconsistent with an absolute prohibition um, of that. Now, they're capable of doing that. I mean, before it was an ambiguity about what was native or what was it, but this is a, an express uh, prohibition of cultivars, and you can't both require them to comply with the plan that they submitted to the Conservation Commission and include the sentence. And it seems to me that the larger issue here is, is the cult is that they that they basically do what they told the Conservation Commission that they would do. Um, and I sort of leave it at that. I do not believe that there would that would pose any issue for the Conservation Commission. Okay. And for the record, a cultivar is defined as a plant variety that has been produced in cultivation by selective breeding. We'll just strike that one sentence from I-13. So if, if I may, on a, I have a different issue on I-13 that, that is more technical, um, but I would propose that we write, that we say uh, after the first sentence, in the event that the AAN ceases to exist or to issue or maintain relevant standards, such planting shall be installed and maintained in accordance with standards established by a successor organization, if any. And if there is no successor organization, then a generally acceptable standard setting organization satisfactory to the Conservation Commission. Uh, you know, this is a condition that we're imposing in perpetuity, but mm -hmm. standard setting bodies often don't last that long um, and it's in other contexts this is sort of a standard approach for dealing with the situation where out a few years uh, the it's not literally possible to uh, to comply with the condition because uh, the standard setting body isn't isn't establishing those conditions at this point okay. I've, I've given that language to mr haverty so he should he would have it exactly, but I could read it again if you wanted. I have it. Everybody all set with that? Fine by me. Okay. Um, I 14 is the last one on page 30. Any last questions on that? Okay, moving on to page 31. Um, does anybody have anything on I-15, 16, 17, or 18? None. Page 32. Um, question on, e, on I-21. Um, Erosion control should be installed up gradient of the banks of the relocated Ryder Brook once the channel has been graded and stabilized. And what I was trying to remember was whether this was the condition where there was some question in at the July 26th meeting about um, protection of the brook during subsequent construction phases. I asked Mr. Revelak if he has access to those notes that was july 26 you said yeah uh okay all right got the page here skimming for the word rider
Remember, we had a discussion. No, I don't have section of Ryder Brook during subsequent construction phases. And I don't know if we specifically need to include something here or not. But I think that this, what this says is that basically is that once relocated, once Ryder Brook has been relocated, that the erosion control should be installed so that any subsequent earthwork will not result in sediment falling into the Ryder Brook. Which I should be fine. But I think in the meeting, we had some discussion about whether a temporary pipe should be installed to divert the water during subsequent phases. Ah, I found it, hmm. I think. Okay. So uh, July 19th. Ah, okay. For Ryder Brook, the concern is that flow capacity is maintained throughout the project. Uh, the applicants will have a separate NOI hearing with the Conservation Commission regarding the relocation of the brook. That works. Okay. So what is the change to this condition supposed to be then? So just between the erosion control should be installed, upgrading of the banks of the relocated Rider Brook. Yep. And then I don't know if banks needs to be capitalized or not. I, I think. In a sense, it probably does not need to be capitalized. Then the correction I was going to recommend to I-22 has already been done. Just the insertion of the word conservation before the word commission. So that's all set. So anything else on the eyes? Seeing none, that would move us into the J's. Um, so J1, 2, and 3 on page 32, is there? Um, Oh, it's now only J1 and J2 on page 32. All right. Seeing nothing there. That moves us to page 33. Um, under J4. Um, on the last sentence, I was wondering if we should change it to parking of vehicles on private ways, not under the control of the applicant is prohibited. Not under the control or the sole control? The sole control. Because basically they do have a private way that has marked parking spaces on it. So we should just make sure that, that we're not contradicting that. That was the only thing I had on the J's. Is there anything else on the J's? Brings us down to the decision. I would pass over for the moment uh, to move on to the waivers. So uh, the first one is section uh, 563, prohibits multifamily uses. Uh, the applicant seeks a waiver to allow 124 multifamily. Hey, Mr. Chairman? Yeah. On, on this, I mean, actually, if, if I recall, uh, the section prohibits residential use. And I think we should just say that. Mm -hmm. so, so the this section prohibits multifamily uses in the industrial zoning district. The applicant seeks a waiver 
to allow multifamily use in the industrial district? No, I th uh, the section prohibits residential use in the industrial zoning district. It's not, it wouldn't, single family isn't allowed here either. That's true. Um, and, and I think we should just accurately say what the ordinance says and then, or the bylaw says. Then I wouldn't bother changing the second sentence because that would be, that's fine. Well, the second- I would just add units after a multi yeah. second sentence. Yeah. And strike the word zoning. Yes. So allow 124 multifamily units in the industrial zoning district. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. and that's, that is a waiver we would be voting to grant. Uh, the next article five, section 562, which has to do with um, dimensional requirements. Applicant press waiver. Is there any question with the contents of that? Okay, the next one is a waiver for section Article 5, Section 53115 which has to do with height setbacks for various buildings. And they're looking for a waiver for the approved plans. Mr. Chairman, yes, please. I don't have any substantive thing, but I, I've, I'm looking at the zoning ordinance and I don't see the one between the three and the 15 that in the citation. I think it should be 5.3.15. It's a section called Buildings of Uneven Height or Alignment, and it's on page 5-8 of the zoning bylaw. All right, which page is the bylaw again? It's on 5-8. The same issue will come up for 5.3.17, the next waiver. Yeah, that's correct. Finally, in the right neighborhood here, 5317 upper story setbacks, 5315. Yep. Okay, so we'll make that change. So then while we're at it, uh, the, in 5317, I think that the intent there is to say this section requires a 7.5 foot step back. Yep. Yeah, I've changed that. Okay. Rather than the semicolon. Yep. yep. Any question about those two waiver requests? Seeing none, that moves us down to Article 5, Section 5.7. Construction of structures within 15 feet of a waterway with the grant of a special permit. To the extent this constitutes a substantive provision, the applicant requests a waiver to allow work within 15 feet of a waterway, including construction of Provost Building Number 2. And the recommended action is a a waiver granted to the extent that this constitutes a substantive requirement. The board denies any procedural waiver of special permit requirements as such waivers are subsumed into the comprehensive permit process and are thus unnecessary. Any question on that? None. Uh, the next article six, section 6112 and the bicycle parking design guidelines 
provisions require a total of one and one half bicycle parking spaces per unit for a total of 186 bicycle spaces. The applicant requests a waiver to allow a total of 114 parking spaces, which would consist of upper level stacked parking, not in accordance with the bicycle parking design guidelines. Um, and I wasn't, I know we have some in here, some requirements in regards to upper level stack parking, but I'm assuming that does not need to be repeated here. Actually, the- in my version it is. Oh, am I looking at an older version? Sorry. I don't know. You've been pretty much on point with me through. <laughs> uh -huh. in, in mine, the, I, I have after, which would consist of upper level slash stack parking, I have, which will require mechanical lift assistance for upper level spaces. Okay. Hmm. I'm not sure why mine is different. Oh, 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 sorry, sorry, I'm reading in the wrong place. Okay, perfect. No. All right, that's fine. Uh, section 614, for 160 parking spaces, the applicant requests a waiver to allow 128 parking spaces. Recommendations for granting. Article 6, section 6111C11, allows up to 20% parking spaces to be compact spaces to the extent that this constitutes a substantive provision, the applicant requests a waiver to allow for eight compact parking spaces. So if we have 160, 128 parking spaces, and do they really need this waiver? They're only requesting eight, which is far less than 20%. Or am I missing something? I think this is probably gets down to whether it's a substantive mm -hmm. requirement or a procedural requirement. I see. Do we need something 6 .1. more akin to waiver granted to the extent that this constitutes right. a substantive requirement? Yep. Okay. I'll add that. And then the next is the Arlington Design Standards. Chairman, I, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Um, there was a discussion, I think, between Ms. Raitt and Mr. Haverty at the hearing, mm -hmm. um, the upshot of which was that the design standards are really part of the environmental design review process and part of the special permit process that is provided for the where, where the ARB is the uh, special permitting uh, agency. Um, and it seems to me, I'm not, I mean, ultimately, the result we want is that the applicant can build what it, the applicant is proposed to build. And it seems to me that this also is one of those places where if in fact it is a substantive condition, we should waive it. Uh, and, but it probably mostly isn't, probably mostly is just part and parcel of the procedures that, that are normally used by the, uh, by the ARB in doing environmental design review. So I would propose using the same formulation we've used elsewhere that we waive it if it's substantive and if we, otherwise we don't waive it because it's unnecessary. Sounds appropriate to me. Okay, next is Title IX, Article 3, Sections 4A and 4B. These sections 
set forth town fees and charges. The applicant seeks a waiver of 50% of fees related to fire safety, building permits, plan review, occupancy permits, plumbing permits, gas fitting, and electrical permits. Also a waiver of 100% of inflow and infiltration fees. And the recommended action is waiver granted as it relates to inflow and infiltration fees. Waiver denied as it relates to fire safety, building permit, plan review, occupancy permit, plumbing permit, gas fitting, electrical permits. Next um, is the Arlington bylaw regulations. Uh, wetlands regulation section 20 restricts work in the banks of the Ryder Brook. Waiver granted subject condition that a deed restriction be placed on the property to protect the land under the relocated Ryder Brook. Regulation section 22 impose a performance regulation for land underwater bodies, restricts work on land underwater bodies and within 25 feet, the applicant requests a waiver to allow the proposed work within Ryder Brook. Uh, the recommendation is the waiver be granted subject to the condition that a deed restriction be placed on the property to protect the land under the relocated Ryder Brook. Uh, the next is wetland regulation section 24. The section restricts vegetation removal within resource areas. The applicant requests a waiver to allow vegetation removal within resource areas. Board action. The uh, recommendation is the waiver be denied. The board is determined in consultation with the Arlington Conservation Commission that the work proposed by the applicant is in compliance with section 24 and authorizes such work as shown on the approved plans as part of this comprehensive permit. Accordingly, no waiver is necessary. Um, wetlands regulation section 25, the section prohibits new buildings within 50 feet of the adjacent upland area unless approved in evaluating the existing total impervious service on site. Applicant requests a waiver to allow new buildings within 50 feet of the aura and the recommendation is that the waiver be denied. The board is determined in consultation with the Arlington Conservation Commission the proposed work complies with section 25 of the Arlington wetlands regulation. Board authorizes such work as shown on the approved plans, therefore no waiver is necessary. Uh, then wetlands bylaw title five, article eight, section 16 and wetlands regulation section 11. Those permitting and consulting fees totaling $15,000. The applicant requests a waiver of 50% of those fees. The board action is waiver partially granted to reduce the fees from $15,000 by 20% to $12,000. We had discussed that prior. And then the last one is Title V, Article 8, Sections 10 and 11. These sections set forth bond requirements for project. The applicant requests a waiver to eliminate the requirement for security to ensure the completion of wetlands work. Um, so the Conservation Commission had come up with a cost to replace the, um, the plantings of $30,000. And they had looked at trying to come up with a more comprehensive figure, but determined that a bond in the amount of $30,000, um, while far less than the cost of the plantings, plus all the, the work that is under, you know, would typically be under the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission, that just sticking with the $30,000 bond request um, in light of this being a comprehensive permit application um, was a fair way of dealing with the reduction in what a total bond value might have been. Um, and so the recommendation coming from the Conservation Commission was to um, use $30,000 as the cost of the, of the bond. $1,000 to cover the cost of replanting? So just that the bond would be in the value of $30,000. And that, that figure was set by the value to replace the plantings. Um, but obviously it could be used for any purpose involved in the relocation of Ryder Brook. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, I'm not, I mean, it, it's, it's difficult under the circumstances to disagree with the Conservation Commission. This is essentially um, 
the bond is there to provide them with adequate assurance that the that the conditions that they want are actually dealt with. But I just would like to say for the record that I don't really feel particularly comfortable um, restricting the amount of the bond in that way. It seems to me that that the bond really ought to be whatever the regulations normally normally require. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and I and I and I hate to have precedent set that in some other case, cases uh, would lead us to to feel compelled to authorize a more limited bond than is really realistic or necessary uh, because we've already done it in this case. Um, so I get that there must have been a lot of discussion that I was wasn't privy to, and that. Uh, the Conservation Commission is kind of the agency mostly in charge there, but I would say that I'm not entirely comfortable with the resolution that the that we have before us. Anything further on on what what does the wetlands bylaw provide for in terms of a bond. <laughs> So there's so section 10 bonds and covenants conservation commission may as part of a permit allowing work require in addition to any security required by any other town or state board commission agency or officer the performance and observance of the conditions imposed here under be secured by one or in part by one and in part by the other of the methods described in the following clauses a and b so clause a is by a proper bond or deposit of money or negotiable security sufficient in the opinion of the Conservation Commission to secure performance of the conditions and observance of the safeguard of such permit. And B, by covenant executed and duly recorded by the owner of record running with the land whereby the conditions and safeguards included in such permit shall be performed before any lot may be conveyed by mortgage deed. And section 11, bond to secure corrections of flooding conditions. Conservation Commission shall require that any developer proposing to build a structure exceeding 6,000 square feet in area, which structure lies within 200 yards of an existing stream or wetland, be required to post a proper bond, a deposit of money, or negotiable securities in lieu thereof sufficient in the opinion of the commission to secure performance of such measures determined by the commission as necessary to correct any flooding condition on the site of the proposed development that existed prior to the construction of same or is likely to result as a consequence of construction. The commission shall ensure the bond shall be in effect, in effect for a minimum of five years. Now it occurs to me, of course, I should just go ahead and share that. So let's switch what I'm sharing here. So what the board's decision here would be is to not grant a waiver and then say that a bond is required as set forth in condition. And I would make it I-2 because we were actually going to be deleting the prior I-2. And that saves me a lot of formatting headaches. <laughs> but then for the condition I-2, I would state the applicant shall provide a bond in the amount of $30,000 pursuant to wetlands bylaw title five, article eight, sections 10 and 11. So you're not really setting any precedent. The, the Conservation Commission has set the amounts pursuant to their bylaw and that's what you're requiring. Okay. Yeah, I think that addresses that appropriately. And as you say, it does 
resolve some other issues with formatting too. So that's good. Is there any further discussion of any provisions of the proposed decision? Is there anyone on the board who does not feel that we are in a position to take a vote on this application? Mr. Haverty, how do you recommend we proceed? Recommend that you proceed to taking a vote um, on the decision as discussed and with the changes that were discussed tonight, which I have been working on and will mm -hmm. submit. Okay. that in mind. May I have a motion on the application, the comprehensive permit application for 1165 RMS Massachusetts Avenue. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I move that the application uh, in this case be, <clears throat> be approved in accordance with the decision uh, as amended uh, in our discussions uh, tonight, and that the let me pause for a second. Should one motion take do both the waivers and the decision, Mr. Haverty? Uh, and subject to the uh, and so I'm, let me try again. I I move that the application in this case be approved uh, in accordance with the decision before the uh, board as amended in our discussion tonight, and that the waivers that are appended to this decision uh, are treated in accordance with the, uh, uh, in accordance with the uh, decision itself. Second. Thank you. Um, Mr. Haverty, is that, um, Motion sound appropriate? Yes. Perfect. Um, with that, um, so we have six members present. We need, we have five who are voting members. Um, so uh, we'll, because, um, this, so, uh, Ms. because Mr. O'Rourke is no longer available for this hearing. Uh, we'll need one of the two associates to vote on this. Um, I don't know if there's a good way to decide this. You guys have both put in so much so much work on this. I hate to help. I, I'd, I'd like to recommend um, Mr. Revelat because I did miss one. So he he's <laughs> ousted me by one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Ford. I pre really appreciate that. Um, so the vote on the motion, uh, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Revelak. Aye. And the chair votes aye. So it's a unanimous decision to approve the comprehensive permit application for 1165R Massachusetts Avenue as conditioned um, as detailed in the decision. Thank you all very, very much. Uh, what's, is there anything further we need to do, Mr. Caverty, on this? I need to send you the final version and it needs to be signed. Okay. And submitted to the town clerk. Perfect. I should extend my sincere gratitude uh, to you, Mr. Haverty, to um, 
all the, the folks in town who from in all the various departments and commissions and boards and committees who have put time in um, on behalf of the Zoning Board of Appeals on this application. We, uh, we greatly appreciate everyone's uh, contributions. Um, and those of our peer consultants beta group um, and everything on behalf of the, the applicant and all of their um, their subs consultants and especially uh, members of the general public who have taken a strong interest in this case and have provided uh, this board with uh, considerable input and considerable um, uh, knowledge that uh, we would not otherwise have. And we greatly appreciate those contributions from everyone. Next. As we have been doing recently, I want would like to just put up our ongoing calendar, um, which has gotten a little bit long. <laughs> Find this. So today was Thursday, September second. So that was that one is completed. Our so we are complete ahead of the September fourth deadline for eleven sixty five R. Um, so our next meeting is um, Thursday, September 9th at 7.30, which is the continuation of Thorndike Place. There's been a considerable amount of new information that has been um, submitted to the board in the last few weeks. And so I encourage everyone to take the time to carefully review all those documents. Um, and after that, our next Tuesday, September 14th, we have three new hearings, uh, 20. 20A Lafayette Street, 14 Nicod Street, and 53 Marathon Street. Uh, Tuesday, September 28th, we're scheduled as a continuation for Thorndike Place. We are currently scheduled to close the public hearing for Thorndike Place on October 8th. Um, and that obviously is subject to um, the status of the hearings. Then we have two new dates, which um, wow. have been made public before. So Tuesday, October 12th at 7.30, we have five hearings scheduled, uh, 1416 Edgerton Road, 18 Heard Road, 125-127 Webster Street, 43 Fox Meadow Lane, and 24 Ottawa Road. Um, and then two weeks after that, on Tuesday, October 26th at 7.30, we're scheduled for two, two hearings. I've been told three, but only two addresses came through, which is 5 Cheviot Road and 43 Cutter Hill Road. Um, so that's 10 additional hearings that are coming up <laughs> before the end of October on top of Thorndike Place. Um, so just to sort of keep that in mind for everyone. Um, so before we close tonight's hearing, I want to take a couple minutes to announce there are some changes coming to the membership of our board in our coming months. Um, so member Sean O'Rourke, and associate members, uh, Stephen Revelack and Aaron Ford have all indicated uh, they intend to resign from the board at the conclusion of the two comprehensive permit hearings presently in front of the board. Um, I want to acknowledge their service to the town and to this board, and I sincerely thank them and their families for their contributions and dedication to the board. I truly appreciate their willingness to see those cases through to their conclusions, and the, the board will honestly not be the same without you guys. Um, so uh, we'll be very glad to have you um, through the end of Thorndike Place. Um, we appreciate that. Uh, with that in mind, if there are any town residents who would be interested in serving on the Zoning Board of Appeals or any other town board committee or commission, um, you can type committee openings into the search bar on the town's website and select the link for committee openings page. Um, I have given notice to the um, town manager's office that we'll be looking for um, additional people come the, come the fall. So, but thanks, special thanks um, 
you know, to to the three of to the three of you. I know Sean's not here tonight, but uh, to Aaron and to Stephen for your service on this board. It's really been greatly appreciated. And with that, I thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. I especially wish to thank Rick Valarelli, Vincent Lee, and Kelly Linema for all their assistance in preparing for and hosting this online meeting. Please note the purpose of the board's recording of the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of the proceedings. And it's our understanding that the recording made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the ZBA's website. Mr. Havity, is there anything further we need to, to do on this case? Nope. Very good. I've well, emailed the final draft, uh, Mr. Chairman, to you and to Mr. Hamlin. Perfect. Then I guess to conclude tonight's meeting, I would look for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Mr. Hanlon, do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Uh, vote of the board, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Revelak? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. Here votes aye. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Thank Good night, everybody. Good night, guys. Good night, guys.